targeting beliefs that you think are important to yourself and they can't give an objective reason why. It must be because they hate you. It must be because they're racist, which maybe they are in this case. The only response to this sort of analysis we got, and this engages with Paul's substantive debate, is that, oh, we shouldn't assimilate people. And the actual logic here was, bigots get angry if they see a difference. So the logical conclusion is we get rid of difference so the bigots don't get angry and we can give the aboriginals a little bit of money when they live off in the desert. This is absurd, ladies and gentlemen. We think assimilate, uh, integration, like has occurred in the United Kingdom, where people see cultural beliefs being practiced in a way full of consent and full of general happiness, give them the money, let the communities live off on their own, is greatly preferable to caving to the interests of bigots. We think that point was classically Australian. Second thing I want to talk about then is dismantling diaspora ties. Because what you do in this situation is you essentially say the minority community in the West cannot match the behaviour in the third world or their home country of these people. So marriages won't be recognised because you've banned polygamy, they won't be, they'll be seen as apostates or heretics. We see that means they get no support from home and they get a sense of dislocation and a loss of identity. So, at the end of the speech, where do we sit? We sit with a team that has to engage with the question of objectivity and subjectivity, and they have not. They say sexism without defining, they cause more destruction than they say, and they harm immigrant communities. We proudly oppose. Madam Speaker, if you listen to the opposition, what it means to be coerced is to be physically forced, to be held at gunpoint, or to be a child. On side affirmative, we stood for in this debate a conception of consent that was more nuanced than that. We said there are some circumstances when forces act on you to limit your choices that may not necessarily come in the form of a weapon or a bruise, but have the same effect of enslavement. It's just the kind of enslavement that through the networks of values that the first speaker spoke about, or through the tyranny of time that the second speaker told about, people begin to accept themselves. And we think that one of the most pernicious things about the way that cultural autonomy of indigenous groups has oppressed women is that it's enlisted those women in their own oppression. And that's what we stood against on this side of the house. First of all, I'm going to analyse conceptions of coercion and relativism. Second of all, I'm going to look at whether state-based change or organic-based change is best for women. To this first question, the first thing we'd say here is there are other forms of coercion. So, premise of opposition case, cultural values are incredibly important to people. We accepted that when we said some cultural autonomy would be granted to groups in recognition of past wrongs done to indigenous peoples. We recognise that cultural values are incredibly important to people. So, if under their characterisation, women, in certain circumstances, must choose to an arranged marriage or to leave their cultural group, what level of choice does that woman have when they, under their own analysis, recognise that women really values that cultural autonomy? But furthermore, what we said is that in, where, where individuals over a long period of time have been exposed to, 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 to information which has said not only uh, do, do, must you accept this particular role, but you do not have the capacity to accept this particular role. Because their very Western conception of what consent was operates differently in indigenous groups, where women are not just told that you must sit in a particular place of the council, but you are separated from decisions about whether, the, whether the, how the council should be arranged in the first place. We think that the analysis of whether and to, to what extent women should own their bodies and express views about their bodies are fundamentally different. And they recognised that when they said that even if it was true that some societies would say that you could physically damage a woman with rape, that they were correct on that. We said just taking it a step further for the groups who, who grow up in society being told perpetually that they are less than. They then question the capacity for us to know what is discrimination in the first place. We think there is a space between difference and inequality. So, it's true that boys and girls schools exist, and we'd be fine with that on the side of the affirmative. What we'd be unhappy with is girls learning home economics while boys learn economics, and not having the choice for boys to perhaps learn home economics and girls to learn economics. 
We are happy with goods to be distributed differently uh, on, uh, uh, based on certain forms of identity. What we're unhappy with is for individuals within those identity classes to have no choice or say about why they position themselves in relation to those goods. So that girls are forced, therefore, by nature of that education, of the hypothetical education system into a particular set of careers rather than choosing that career for themselves on the outset. So, what we think in this, in this debate is that where individuals, uh, we, we always think the role of the state is, is that where individuals have questionable levels of consent, they must apply higher scrutiny to their decisions. Which is why that makes it different, right? So, so to say someone who's been highly educated or exposed to a great degree of lifestyles, making decisions about the rights they hold in a particular society or the things that they're willing to consent to. As to someone who lives in indigenous communities, which was the subject of the topic of this debate, and are often fundamentally isolated, as Elle explained, lacking in educational standards, and lagging behind dramatically, even immigrant groups in the, from conservative cultures in society, in terms of the conception of the values of women. But furthermore, as she explained as well, these are the groups that have been told by the state that cultural autonomy is awesome. And it's very difficult for those women then to recognise what, what, to carve up that cultural autonomy and recognise the bits that they should reject because we already essentialise them through the form of granting these cultural autonomy rights in the first place, that, that, that your conception of being is correct. And that was supported by this opposition in terms of relativism. So that doesn't mean the state inhabits entirely the lives of these women. It means that we set up certain frameworks of understanding what ideal decision-making conditions would be. And when we deviate extremely from those, uh, those, those conditions, we apply extremely high degrees of scrutiny to the decisions that are made, which may be going into these communities and ensuring that sometimes women engage in discussions where they're sitting in the front row, that sometimes women are the, ensuring women are educated um, even uh, to high levels of, of degrees, even if their families don't want that. So you know, encouraging women to go to university even if their families don't support that because we think their decisions are fundamentally coerced. We think that furthermore, there are some basic rights that we do not allow people to consent to just the, the removal of which we do not allow people to consent to just because they think that will ultimately benefit them in this debate. So, connectedness was one thing they thought was really important in this debate. Well, we think that connectedness would lead circularly to always, uh, to, to, to past traditions, to never challenging fundamentally those traditions. And we think that while individuals might value that connectedness as it exists, as I'll explain to you, the challenge that the state presents to these women, often then they later find that the connectedness is compatible to being, to, to, to being women and also being indigenous. The next thing I want to say is that some, not all reallocations of power are bad. But let us you know, beg the massive question. If Richard and his partner were a member of indigenous society and Richard's partner was, in, was enforcing indigenous culture, obviously we would object to that. In instances where we thought that reallocation occurred in perfect conditions of consent, we wouldn't. What we think is that ultimately that's the role of the state when we recognise that traditionally when we've left women in, the, in, in, in these particular conditions to be exposed to those environments and that's damaged their welfare in the long run. The state has a particular responsibility to those individuals. So let's move on then to why, why we think the state is going to be effective at doing this. They said that this is just going to lead people to hide these practices, especially by expelling women from these societies that oppose them, which conceded that organic change was incredibly difficult. But also, women pose, the women that, that, that support radical change or pose a threat much in the same way that the state do and will be alienated much in the same way that the, that the state do. But the second thing is, is that organic change is something these women are going to have to wait for a very long time. But we've nominated certain goods by enshrining them, say, in constitution and bills, not, not perhaps subjectively, or objectively, but intersubjectively, as incredibly important things to have, like an education, the capacity to make decisions about your future economic life. We don't think that's acceptable. But the third thing we say is we provide these groups with cover, um, uh, under, under, uh, with, with women, with cover under our model. So when the men in the group say, you can't do that, that's not indigenous, they can, talk, they can appeal to the state rights that they've granted them, which means that under their side, they can still hide dangerous practices the state refuse, but we provide them with more acceptable cover to oppose those, the, the, the values and scrutinize the values presented to them. Because we thought that if they thought, if they thought on the side that, the, that every time a state intervenes on your choice, that's coercion, but didn't recognize the intervention that occurs from cultural groups as well, as also limiting choice and having an ideological function. We thought, um, <clears throat> we thought insofar as that's true, the kind of practices they really want to pose in this debate, like rape and FGM, would also be difficult to deal with in these communities when they've accepted this idea of relativism. So even if this side opposes the connection between not sending a woman to school or allowing to, uh, to hold economic positions and rape and domestic violence, that argument is argues more difficult for an illiterate indigenous woman to make in that community, or women who's been denied, denied education in that community to then protect those rights they thought were so important, like protection from violence. State-based change was incredibly important. Both sides talked about the example of secular change that occurred in society. We think Stockholm Syndrome was what happened there, where women thought that it was fine. And we recognise that on both sides' houses, it's a bit chicken and egg in terms of change. 
What we thought was the most radical and important catalyst of change was that in, in, lo in lots of societies, especially societies we've introduced these laws to in the latter part of the 20th century, the majority of women opposed it, but then as a result of gradual change, as Elle gave you the example of Inuit in different parts of Canada, have fundamentally challenged those values in a way that they couldn't previously. They want to talk about indigenous communities and, and their relationship to other communities in society. But when we weren't pandering to racists in this debate, what we were saying is that the existence of these, these oppressive traditional practices about something that someone cannot change as a woman allow them cover to, be, to, to get through other racist laws and disempower indigenous people in other ways, which is against the interests of the whole indigenous group and society. We thought that this was ultimately dislocated groups from the, the, the whole society as, as a whole, which removed their capacity to get utility in the future. We thought, um, Madam Speaker, that this was something that we could objectively determine was damaging to women. That's why we were so proud to propose. The affirmative's case in this debate has been based on looking at the consequence of a particular cultural practice, a particular indigenous cultural practices, and then inferring backwards from that consequence that consent has not occurred. The reason they've failed in this debate is because they've done so by suffusing their case with ideas about impartiality, ideas about rationality, ideas about the fact that they can establish what inferiority actually means, without actually fleshing out why that perspective is more legitimate than the grounded and essential um, social perspective from which these norms are developed. At the end of this debate, I'm going to ask three very simple questions. The first and most important is what is a cultural practice? The second is why does state imposition of uh, like conformity actually harm women? And the third is why state imposition actually slows down the cultural integration we want to see in this debate. Firstly then, what is a cultural practice? A cultural practice basically is a pattern of behavior which regulates people's um, behavior, sorry, a pattern of behavior which regulates people's social interactions with each other. A particular um, cultural practice that I engage in is swearing quite often with, when I'm with my friends. Other people don't engage in that same practice, right? But that's not because one is objectively better than the other, it's because people have different norms about what constitutes politeness. Another type of cultural practice is discrimination. Discrimination is treating two groups of people differently on the basis of some characteristic. In this case, the operative one is gender. So the question then becomes, how should we judge discrimination as a cultural practice? What we told you on the negative side of the house is that these kinds of cultural practices are always grounded not from an impartial, uh, the perspective of an, of an impartial spectator, not from some uh, uber rational perspective where, which we can, like, godlike perspective, right? They're grounded in social relationships. They're grounded in the lived experience of everyday life and your interactions with your surrounds, and your interactions with your family and your friends. What that means is that they're inherently subjective standards. And, we, and, so what, and so then what were the attacks on that from the affirmative side of the house? They said, look, they might be subjective, but we can, we can kind of objectify them, right? By doing things like measuring people's happiness. Like, how do we measure people's happiness, right? We can't stick a probe into their brain to determine the number of utils that like, come about when they participate in practice, right? Because they're like, judged from the inside. Then they said, look, we do have a standard. We do have a standard. It's called inferiority. Again, just begging the very question that we're trying to prove in this debate. And then they said, well, look, some women are uneducated. So maybe you could be right in some circumstances if they have alternative choices. But even in women who are uneducated, like if, if they're uneducated, which means that then most of their cultural ties or most of their social ties are bound in the very relationships with their family and with their social circle, then it is precisely the most important for them to continue to be able to judge the world from that very lens. And then they said, look, well, like, what, oh, well, so maybe, maybe some of them can consent, maybe some of them can be bound by the subjective standard, but not all of them. 
So we should allow, like, we should basically oppress the, the minority in order to like service the majority, right? But the problem is their model doesn't do that. It bans all of them. I think that's an inappropriate moral community to pay. The next level of this point then was this. They tried to point out a contradiction, right? They said, look, you've made a, you've made a contradiction on the affirmative side because you have an objective standard. You have an objective standard that coercion is always bad. Here's why coercion isn't always bad and how we can justify removing that from the subjectivity of cultural practices. It's because coercion disrupts, physical, physical coercion actually disrupts your ability to actualize your cultural preferences in a way without being harmed physically, right? And that's why we think that emotional kind of, um, that emotional complicity, that emotional enslavement, or the idea that women are complicit in the role of coercion doesn't stand up in this debate. And the reason why is because if it's true that you are complicit in a particular cultural practice just because you've engaged in it for a long period of time, then they are complicit in Western Enlightenment thinking, right? People could easily make the same criticism from the flip side by saying, like, look, you have an idea that equity of treatment between genders equals the quality of treatment between genders. You are enslaved by Hume and Locke, who made that point 300 years ago in your Western culture. That's the kind of criticism that could come from an indigenous culture, and one that they haven't been able to uh, uh, like justify, objectify from this side of the house, right? So they are participating in precisely the kinds of um, complicit coercion that they're trying to oppose. And that's why the case is illogical on that first principled level of the debate. We've given you a better conception of what cultural practices are by showing you why they're grounded in objectivity, and the only exception we should make are when physical violence threatens people's ability to actualize those preferences. The next two points in this debate then are how, why does, so the next point is why does state imposition actually harm women? All they said on their side of the house is that state down change can work. State down change can create culture, um, cultural change, um, in a number of ways. The first way they said is because it gives cover for women within a particular culture to oppose uh, practices they disagree with, right? The problem with this is that the kind of cover that it gives them is complicity with an enemy, complicity with an external force which is imposing that, cult that cultural change on them, right? And we know this because the state isn't giving cultures a choice to get their support. The state is forcing their support on indigenous cultures, and it's doing that because it's using this monopoly of force to prosecute those who defer from its judgment. So that's not the kind of cover that these women actually need. That's the kind of cover which pushes them out of their very cultural practice. The next thing I said is, look, we have created a cultural change in the past, Look at the women's suffrage movement. Look at like increasing um, women's liberation after the 80s in the workplace. But what we've shown you is that they've, they've actually put the cart like miles ahead of the horse here, right? Because those reactions by the well, those were reactions by the government to cultural change. They didn't create the cultural change in the first place. They responded to a change from the top down when women and Western culture actually changed in the direction which they now think is positive. What we've shown you on our side of the house is that there are significant harms when you basically treat women as vessels for Western and cultural hegemony. Do you do things like destroy individuals' conceptions and connections with the past when you say that it is sexist for Māori women to sit at the back of the marae, they, they should not be that cultural practice tolerated, and we will prosecute any, uh, any iwi who engage in that practice. We will prosecute any tribe who engage in that practice. Women will be shocked by that conception, but that is oppression of the West on their cultural practice. It's something which we think is a harm to those very women they want to protect. The other thing we've told you is that you alienate them from the, their, their cultures, and you alienate them from the ways in which they see the world. Right? You, if, if you uh, like to tell a particular Aborigine uh, culture that like some religious practice they have, which uh, requires separate treatment, is one which is simply illegitimate because of rationality and because of objectivity, that's the kind of harm that you've caused in this other house. And what they've said here is basically, look, the problem is women can't control their destiny because it's all about history and it's all about conditioning. They said that you shouldn't ever have to make a trade-off between equity and cultural autonomy. But the problem is, again, they're banning people from ever making that choice, right? And that's why we think that choice is intensely personal. When you ban it, you create harm to those women. And that's the cultural harm a state in position does to the very women that they're trying to best protect. The last point in this debate, then, is why state in position actually slows down cultural integ integration, which we agree is an end that, um, in this debate. They said this, when a culture has, is different in particular ways which are dog whistles or like, like, li like liberal progressives or whatever, then people start to get angry at those particular cultures and start to withdraw political support for them, withdraw funding, treat them as like the outsider, and all those kinds of things which make them further um, pushed out of mainstream society. That's not what we've seen empirically, by the way, in, in the UK, when we've had multicultural as a policy for the last 30 years, when Muslim communities in Britain were treated as different and given money in bulk by the government to do what they will with, within their own cultural practice, despite their significant differences, right? That's why we told you that their policy is actually code for pandering to people who can't deal with difference. We think that's going to be exacerbated under their model. It's going to be exacerbated because of the minority communities themselves are going to become more insular and more angry with the outside world. 
when they see that they've been forced to change their practices by an aggressive, monopolistic uh, force using state who doesn't treat them with the respect they deserve, uh, like the cultural respect they deserve. We also told you, told you, Richard, that they're going to lose their ties if they do choose to join the arms of like Western liberalism. They're going to lose their ties with those cultures which they consider to be essential to them. They're going to lose the support of their families. They're going to lose the support of their friends. All of those things are actual direct harm to the individuals, which we think um, slows down the process of cultural integration we want to see in this debate. At the end of this debate, what we've shown you is that cultural practices are rooted in subjectivity. And we've shown you why, given that fact, the kind of imposition that they're uh, proposing leads to uh, atrocious moral outcomes. That's why we're wondering about The world's made up of a series of individuals who all make decisions for themselves and decisions which we can never truly understand the background for. The only person that can understand that decision is that person themselves. And that's why the line that we draw on side permanent, sorry, on side negative, is the line where people aren't able to make those decisions because those people are forced and compelled to make particular decisions. Any other decision is fine. So the four issues in this debate are, how do we assess cultural practices? What are the benefits to individuals from particular cultural practices? What are the harms from the affirmative proposal? And finally, how do we get cultural change? So let's look at side affirmative uh, and, and, and how they assess cultural practices. And at first, as I mentioned in my first response, we had words like inferior, like rational. At second, when we asked them the question, where are you coming from? They gave us a response. We have a standard, an objective standard, it's inferiority, without going any further whatsoever. And at third, the response was, we're very, very clever. We think that we can look into people's minds better than they can. What we gave you was consent. And it, we drew this line particularly validly and securely when we said compulsory female genital mutilation is not okay, voluntary female genital mutilation is okay. It was pretty clear what we were standing up for right from the start. But again, they thought they were cleverer than that. They thought that women would be enlisted in their perpetual inferiority without ever engaging with our fundamental point right here. The more enlisted a woman could be in perpetuating her inferiority, the more cultural benefit she gets from what they call an inferiority, which is not actually to her, therefore, an inferiority. Okay, the second question about benefits to individuals from cultural practices. And the first thing to say is women get benefits from accessing their culture, benefits which they are directly locked out by that side, locked out of by that side of the house. Of course they have no choice to whom they're born from. Of course they have no choice the culture that they're born into. But when they're brought up into that culture, they are, even if enlisted, although we think we prefer to use nicer words like that they are given the benefits of a culture, they want to unlock that and they're able to unlock that. Secondly, that means that it's fine to choose what they would say is inferiority. It's fine to accept another's decision. This was the example that Richard gave about one partner trading off another partner's decision. That's absolutely fine because it gives them an inferiority, maybe, from the outside, but a benefit in their personal relationship. Thirdly on this, though, we had an absurd point from Paul, which is that there are unknown benefits, benefits which you can't conceive of if you're within a particular indoctrinated group. The first response to that is, of course, people can conceive of things. Maori people can conceive of the possibility of sitting at the front of the marae. People that wear particular clothes can conceive of taking off those clothes. They can conceive of what's out there, but when you force them to take up what's out there, it always comes as a direct trade-off to a benefit that they currently have. So even if there is a benefit to sitting at the front, you get a better view or you look more Western, you immediately trade off a benefit which they already have and feel is more important in accessing their ancestral history and sitting at the back. So every time you show them they might, something they might not have realised, you trade it off with something that they, in the immediate self, think is more important. 
Third point, then, is about harm from the affirmative proposal. The first point is one that's implicit throughout all of the points. Women lose out. People who, even if absurdly, make decisions are no longer able to make those decisions, and so they're the ones that are treating women as inferior because they're the ones that aren't allowing women to choose for themselves in an objective way, for, sorry, in a subjective way for them. The second response, though, is there is a harm in communities. There's a very, very strong community harm where those communities now become segregated from the wider nation and indigenous communities can no longer lock in to a wider nation. Because if you say to a woman who wants to pay a dowry, the state will stop you if they find out about you paying that dowry, that person won't marry a Westerner. They won't invite Westerners to their wedding. They'll disengage from the wider culture around them because they know that at the second that they engage with that culture, something that they want to do will be stripped away from them and that means that these people are segregated, indigenous communities fall away or become more insular. The final point then is how do we get cultural change? And we don't need to prove this point. We don't need to prove that cultural change is a benefit because we've shown that culture is a benefit, but they do need to prove this point. What do they give us? The state-imposed cultural change is the best one. Their example was never able to be come, come back to or, or uh, you know, give it a better one when I responded by assessing it, when we said that Western culture actually changed culturally before it assessed state-based change in the form of women fighting for the vote and that sort of thing. But secondly, if you want change from within, which is what we want on our side of the house, the second someone tries to influence that change, they're kicked out of the culture because they're now siding with the Westerners, they're siding with the objectivity that that side of the house thinks we can assess things by. That side of the house has never understood that every time we show someone a benefit that they couldn't previously conceived of, we strip away a benefit that they currently conceive of and enjoy, we're proud to oppose. In this debate, both teams conceded that norms could be created by cultural groups and by the state. The problem with the negative team's case in today's debate was that they only wanted to acknowledge that the state in creating norms was a form of coercion and never wanted to deal with the fact that culture in creating norms was also a form of coercion that operated upon individuals. Two questions in reply. The first is much shorter than the other, and I will concede that now. Firstly, should we treat cultural practice relatively or objectively? So the negative team told you two things. Firstly, they said that we have to treat these things subjectively or relatively, because otherwise we could never understand the choices that were made. We had a couple of responses. The first was to say that if it was true that we could not understand these choices, it was curious as to why we were allowing women in what both sides conceded were patriarchal societies to be dictated to by the patriarchy of that society, who by their analysis could not conceive of that choice for women either. Secondly, we told you that although it was true that the state wasn't going to understand the individual nature of every choice, that the state could interrogate forces acting on consent, psychological or physical, and that we should do that. But lastly on this issue, we told you that we shouldn't treat cultural practice at a relative stance because there were significant harms to treating it like that. Because if we said that we were happy with cultural practice because it was all relative and subjective, that people would have less of an ability to empower themselves even where they individually disagreed with that culture. We told you that it made it harder for communities to change from within because you'd already given them the excuse that their culture was relative and subjective and no one could judge it. We also told you that it meant that mainstream society was more justified in not helping that group. And that was Paul's substantive material. But let's look at what the state could consider in judging the forces that act on consent. It became very clear at second negative, at second neg, that their standard of what consent was was very low. It was whether it was physically forced, held at gunpoint, or whether you were a child. All of those things would have denied the types of social change, like granting women the vote and allowing them to work, that we pointed to, because those changes did not actually, and you might want to listen, guys, those changes did not actually involve physical force, but allowed liberals in society to have top-down change that changed the minds of conservatives. 
But we also told you that physical coercion could act in exactly the same coercive way as a physical force. What did we tell you about this? We told you that cultural coercion was the case because people didn't know any better. And if we were to accept that people could only choose cultures relatively, then people within Indigenous cultures were unable to choose or look at other options. At third negative, we heard that everyone views the world from their own viewpoint, which conceded that they were conditioned to only see the options presented to them. But that was reversed in reply, although I'm not going to rebut that now. Secondly, we told you on this point that these people were conditioned and culturally coerced because they couldn't speak out against their community. We gave you the examples of alcohol bans in Queensland and we told you that the negatives team stance that you could only accept that there was coercion when people spoke up was inadequate because these people were unable to speak up. Thirdly, we told you that they were coerced because they couldn't leave this culture and that that was a harm that even the negative team accepted when they told us that it was traumatic for people to leave their own culture. We told you in this debate, Madam Speaker, that consent wouldn't mean anything if people couldn't conceive of their other options and that if they made divergent choices, the harms would be significant to them. The only thing you heard from the negative team was a circular logic that there is benefit, therefore people consent because there is benefit. In the same breath, they told you they couldn't measure happiness. That's why their standard of consent was never able to be as distinct as they wanted it to be. And that's why the affirmative team won this debate.